This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 3, for broadcast on the 11th of January 2017. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, YouTube, SoundCloud, Audio Boom, and from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com. The show is also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. Coming up on Space Time, a strange rare galaxy discovered the universe's most powerful cosmic particle accelerator, and the first results from the Parkes Radio Telescope's latest search for ET. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have found an unusual ring galaxy unlike anything ever seen before. The discovery, reported in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, appears to include a well-defined elliptical galaxy-like core surrounded by two circular rings. Located approximately 359 million light-years away, the galaxy named PGC 1000714 appears to belong to a rarely observed class of galaxies known as Hoag-type galaxies. The study's lead author, Burson Mutlupaktil from the University of Minnesota in Duluth, says Hoag-type galaxies make up less than 0.1% of all observed galaxies. The majority of observed galaxies are disc-shaped, like our own Milky Way. But Hoag-type galaxies are round cores, surrounded by a circular ring, with nothing visibly connecting them. Galaxies with unique appearances give astronomers unique insights into how galaxies form and evolve. The authors collected multi-wave band images of the galaxy, which is only easily visible in the southern hemisphere, using a large diameter telescope in the Chilean mountains. These images were then used to determine the ages of the two main features in the galaxy, the outer ring and the central body. The authors found the outer ring appeared somewhat blue in colour, indicating lots of young bright stars, maybe no more than 130 million years old. This outer ring surrounded an older core of stars which are more reddish in colour, indicating they may have been about 5.5 billion years in age. However, the research team was surprised to uncover evidence for a second inner ring surrounding the central body. To document the second ring, the researchers took their images and then subtracted out a model of the core. This allowed them to observe and measure the obscured second inner ring structure. Astronomers have observed galaxies with the blue ring surrounding a central red body before, the best known being Hoag's object. However, study co-author Patrick Truhart from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences says the unique feature of this galaxy is what appears to be an older diffuse red inner ring. Galaxy rings typically are regions where stars have formed from colliding gas. The different colours of the inner and outer rings suggest that this galaxy has experienced at least two different formation periods. It's impossible to know exactly how the rings of this galaxy were formed based just on these initial single snapshots in time. The authors hope by accumulating snapshot views of other similar galaxies, they'll eventually be able to develop a better picture of just how these most unusual galaxies are formed and evolve. While galaxy shapes can be the product of internal or external environmental interactions, the authors speculate that the outer ring may be the result of this galaxy incorporating portions of a once nearby gas-rich dwarf galaxy. They also feel that inferring the history of the older inner ring would require the collection of higher resolution infrared data. Truhart says that whenever scientists find a unique or strange object to study, it usually challenges their existing ideas and assumptions about how the universe works. And that usually means telling them that they still have an awful lot to learn. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Two of the most powerful phenomena in the universe, a supermassive black hole and the collision of two of the largest structures in the universe, giant galaxy clusters, have combined to create one of the most powerful cosmic particle accelerators ever seen. A report in the journal Nature Astronomy claims the spectacle is showing scientists what happens when matter ejected by a giant black hole is swept up in the merger of two enormous galaxy clusters. 
The study's lead author, Renaud Van Weeren from the Harvard-Smithsonian Centre for Astrophysics, says astronomers have seen each of these phenomena separately in many places. But this is the first time they've been able to clearly see these two events linked in the same system. The cosmic double whammy was found in a pair of colliding galaxy clusters known as Abel 3411 and Abel 3412, located about 2 billion light years away. The two clusters are extremely massive, each weighing about a quadrillion, that is a million billion, times the mass of the Sun. NASA's Earth-orbiting Chandra X-ray telescope detected comet-shaped jets of X-rays generated by hot gas in one cluster ploughing through the hot gas in the other cluster. The authors then used the Keck and Subaru telescopes on Mauna Kea in Hawaii to observe the galaxies in each cluster. The cosmic particle accelerator is formed by a supermassive black hole in one of the galaxy clusters, producing a rotating, tightly wound magnetic funnel. The powerful electromagnetic fields associated with this structure then accelerate some of the inflowing gas away from the vicinity of the black hole in the form of an energetic high-speed jet. These already accelerated particles are then accelerated again when they encounter the colossal shock waves generated by the collision of the massive gas clouds associated with the galaxy clusters. These particles are among the most energetic observed anywhere in the universe, thanks to the double injection of energy. The discovery solves a long-standing mystery in galaxy cluster research about the origins of the beautiful swirls of radio emissions seen stretching for millions of light years, which have been detected in both Abel 3411 and Abel 3412. The team determined that as the shock waves travel across the cluster for hundreds of millions of years, the doubly accelerated particles produce giant swirls of radio emission. The study's co-author, William Dawson, from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, says the results clearly show that a remarkable combination of powerful events generate these particle acceleration factories, which are the largest and most powerful in the known universe. Without receiving that initial kick of energy from the black hole, particles that are only accelerated by the shock waves in the cluster collisions simply would not be energetic enough to produce the observed radio emissions. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Astronomers have found a missing link between neutron star pulsars and a type of highly magnetic neutron star known as a magnetar. The study, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, suggested this mysterious object called PSR J1119-6127 could be in a never-before-seen transition state between a pulsar and a magnetar. Since the 1970s, scientists have treated pulsars and magnetars as two very distinct populations of neutron star objects. A pulsar is a rapidly spinning neutron star, the extremely dense stellar corpse of a massive star that exploded at the end of its life in what astronomers call a core collapse or type II supernova. Pulsars are so named because they emit radio waves in predictable pulses due to their fast rotation, which causes them to shine like a revolving lighthouse beam. By contrast, magnetars have violent high-energy outbursts of X-ray and gamma-ray radiation, and they generate the strongest known magnetic fields in the universe. However, the detection of PSR J1119-6127 acting as both a pulsar and a magnetar supports a growing body of evidence over the past decade that these could be separate stages in the evolution of a single object. Victoria Caspi from McGill University, Montreal, says this discovery represents the final missing link in the chain that connects pulsars and magnetars. She says it seems like there's a smooth transition between these two kinds of neutron star behaviours. Sometimes they're a pulsar, and other times they're a magnetar. This object may tell astronomers something new about the underlying mechanism of pulsars in general. When the mysterious object was first discovered in the year 2000, it appeared simply as a radio pulsar. It was mostly quiet and predictable until July 2016. That's when NASA's Fermi and Swift Earth-orbiting space telescopes both observed two X-ray bursts as well as 10 additional bursts of light at lower energies coming from the object. An additional 2016 study also looking at the two X-ray bursts, incorporating observations from NASA's new star, Nuclear Spectroscopic Telescope Array, suggested that the pulsar was behaving more like a magnetar. Astronomers quickly turned NASA's Deep Space Network's 70-metre radio dish in Canberra, the largest dish in the Southern Hemisphere, to see exactly what's going on. They concluded that these X-ray bursts were happening because the pulsar's enormous magnetic field was being twisted as the object was spinning. 
The stress of the twisting magnetic field was so great that it caused the outer crust of the neutron star to crack and break. Sort of analogous to tectonic plate movements on Earth causing earthquakes. These star quakes cause abrupt changes in rotation, a sort of glitch which was seen by a new star. Neutron stars are so dense that one teaspoon of neutron star material, or neutronium, would weigh as much as a mountain. The neutron star's crust, which is thought to be about a kilometre thick with higher pressure and density at greater depths, is a neutron-rich lattice. This particular neutron star is thought to have one of the strongest magnetic fields among the population of known pulsars, literally trillions of times stronger than the magnetic field of our Sun. Two weeks after the X-ray outburst, astronomers were able to track the object's emissions at radio frequencies, which are much lower in energy than X-rays. The radio emissions had sharp increases and decreases in intensity, allowing scientists to quantify how the emission evolved. The researchers used an instrument which they informally refer to as the Pulsar machine, which was recently installed on the 70-metre Canberra Deep Space Network dish. Within 10 days, something completely changed in the Pulsar, and it began acting like a normal radio Pulsar again. As astronomers continued to monitor J1119, they observed a marked brightening in emissions at radio wavelengths in a pattern which was consistent with other magnetars. And that raises the question, which comes first, the pulsar or the magnetar? Some scientists hypothesize that objects like J1119 begin as magnetars and then gradually stop outbursting X-rays and gamma rays over time. But others propose the opposite theory, that radio pulsars come first and over time the magnetic field emerges from the supernova's rubble and then the magnetar-like outbursts begin. To help solve this mystery, much as anthropologists study the remains of human ancestors at different stages of evolutionary history, astronomers now want to find more missing link objects like J1119. It's thought this particular neutron star was likely formed following a supernova event some 1,600 years ago. Discovering and monitoring similar objects may shed new light on whether this phenomenon is specific to J1119, or whether this behaviour is in fact common to all neutron stars. This is Space Time, I'm Stuart Gary. Breakthrough Listen, a 10-year, $100 million astronomical search for intelligent life beyond Earth, has announced its first observations using the CSIRO's Parkes Radio Telescope. The project was launched back in 2015 by theoretical physicist and internet entrepreneur Yuri Milner together with fellow physicist Stephen Hawking. The search uses the Parkes dish together with the Green Bank Radio Telescope in West Virginia and the automated planet finder at the Lick Observatory in California to conduct an ongoing survey to determine whether civilizations exist elsewhere in the universe and, if there are, whether they've developed technologies similar to our own. Breakthrough Listen will use 25% of the science time available in the Parkes Radio Telescope over the next five years. Yuri Milner describes the initial Parkes results as an important milestone. He says these major instruments act like planet Earth's ears, listening for signs of other civilizations. After 14 days of commissioning and test observations, first light for Breakthrough Listen at Parkes was achieved with an observation of the recently discovered planet Proxima b. The Earth-sized planet was discovered back in August 2016 by astronomers with the European Southern Observatory in Chile. It orbits the red dwarf star Proxima Centauri, which is part of the triple star Alpha Centauri system, and at 4.2 light years is the nearest star to the Sun. Proxima b is significant not only because it's similar in size to the Earth, but also because it was found orbiting within the star's habitable zone, the so-called Goldilocks region, where temperatures are not too hot and not too cold, but just right for liquid water to exist on the planet's surface. These Earth-sized extrasolar or exoplanets are among the primary targets of the Breakthrough Listen survey. And as the closest known exoplanet, Proxima b is also the primary target for Breakthrough Listen's sister initiative, Breakthrough Starshot, which is developing the technology to send a swarm of tiny micro-spacecraft to the nearest stars, a project which could see its fruition within our lifetime. With its new combined all-sky range, telescope sensitivity and computing capacity, Breakthrough Listen has become the most powerful, comprehensive and intensive scientific search ever undertaken for signs of intelligent life beyond Earth. The expansion of Breakthrough Listen's range follows the recent announcement that it will be joining forces with China's new FAST telescope, the world's largest field aperture radio receiver, to coordinate their searches for artificial signals. 
The two programs will exchange observing plan search methods and data, including the rapid sharing of promising new signals for additional observation and analysis. This partnership represents a major step forward, establishing a truly connected global search for intelligent life in the universe. Director of the Berkeley SETI Research Center, Dr. Andrew Simeon, who's also leader of the Breakthrough Listen Science Program, admits that the chances of actually finding a particular planet hosting intelligent life forms are probably fairly minuscule. But he says once we knew there was a planet right next door, we simply had to ask the question, and it was all a very fitting first observation for Parks. Needless to say, to find a civilization just 4.2 light years away would change everything. Dr. Douglas Bock, director of CSIRO Astronomy and Space Sciences, says the Parkes Radio Telescope, being positioned in the Southern Hemisphere, is perfectly located to observe parts of the sky that can't be seen from the Northern Hemisphere, including the centre of our own Milky Way galaxy, as well as large regions of the galactic plane and galaxies beyond our own. The Parkes Telescope is the largest single-dish radio telescope in the Southern Hemisphere, and being in the Southern Hemisphere, it's uniquely capable of seeing the centre of our galaxy and other galaxies that you can't see from the Northern Hemisphere. It's got cutting-edge instrumentation, which makes it appropriate for SETI. And it's a telescope with a long history of discovery, including most recently fast radio bursts. Swinburne University and the University of California, Berkeley, are working with the CSIRO to design and implement a signal processing and data storage system for the project that will make the Breakthrough Listen data available to a larger scientific community. Professor Matthew Bales from Swinburne says Breakthrough Listen will do much more than just hunt for ET. The detection system on the park's dish will simultaneously be searching for naturally occurring phenomena, such as pulsars and fast radio bursts, which are already a huge part of the park's telescope's focus. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. A United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket has successfully blasted into orbit, carrying the Echo Star 19 telecommunications satellite. The mission lifted off into blue skies from Space Launch Complex 41 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go Echo Star 19. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, one, we have RD-180 ignition and we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying Echo Star 19. And the has begun. The has gone close of control. You're hearing the voice of Marty Malinowski providing launch vehicle ascent data. The jaw program is complete. Roll program is complete. Water rates look good. Lock one. Boosters throttle back up. Max Q. Vehicle body rates continue to look good. Checker pressures, pump speeds within expected range. SP chamber pressures have plateaued. Burn looks good. The Atlas V launch vehicle in its 431 configuration included three strap-on Rocketdyne AJ-60A solid rocket boosters assisting the core stage RD-180 kerosene and liquid oxygen-fueled Russian main engine. Coming up on SRB burnout. And we have SRB burnout. The SRBs were jettisoned just over two minutes into the flight, leaving the core stage to power the spacecraft for another two and a half minutes until MECO or main engine cutoff and core stage separation. Boosters throttled back up. Engine response looks good. Body rates continue to control down the middle. So we're at 1.6 Gs. Booster is now 50%. It's liftoff weight. Current altitude is 25 miles. Downrange distance, 28.6 miles. Current velocity, 3,444 miles per hour. Range track looks good. Booster has begun Q-alpha limited steering. Only minor body rates at this point. Pump speeds, injector pressures continue to look good. Q-alpha steering has been completed. The RCS pyro valve is now being fired. Systems pressurized into flight levels. Signatures look good. And booster has throttled back down. Engine response continues to look good. Range track shows the vehicle making good progress down. Downrange, current altitude, 47 miles. Downrange distance, 112 miles. Current velocity, 6,800 miles per hour. Booster is now one quarter. It's liftoff weight. Vehicle is accelerating smoothly at 3.7 Gs. Coming up on our throttle segment momentarily. And we have begun throttling to 4.1 Gs. Current altitude is 96 miles. Downrange distance is 466 miles. Current velocity, 12,951 miles per hour. Range track continues to look good. And we have indication of booster PE at this point. Looks like minus 18 pounds. Centaur PU is now in closed loop control. 
Commanding a uh, slightly oxidizer rich condition. Seeing our normal RCS thermal conditioning firings as those lines are warming to bottle temperatures. The Centaur upper stage, powered by a cryogenic liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fueled Aerojet Rocketdyne RL10C engine, then ignited for a nine minute burn. This was the first of two engine burns for the Centaur upper stage to take the payload into orbit. This burn is scheduled for nine minutes in duration, followed by a coast duration of nine minutes and 26 seconds. This is Atlas Mission Control at T plus six minutes, 32 seconds. Marty Malinowski just confirmed the successful completion of the early phase of today's flight and all systems continue to operate nominally. The mission is currently in the first of two Centaur engine burns. Our next event, Centaur main engine cutoff, will occur in approximately seven minutes. And Centaur has begun the roll to Tedris for telemetry optimization. We have had the format change, only a minor loss of data. All data has resumed. Signatures continue to look good. Our all 10 chamber pressures, box pump, and fuel venturi, all good. 32 minutes after launch, the Echo Star 19 satellite was placed into its geostationary transfer orbit. Based on the Space Systems Laurel SSL 1300 platform, the 3,500 kilogram satellite is equipped with 60 KA band spot beam transponders and carries enough fuel for a 15 year lifespan. Once in service, Echo Star 19 will be the world's highest capacity broadband satellite, providing increased high-speed internet services across North America. The flight represented the 115th successful launch for the Boeing Lockheed Martin United Launch Alliance Partnership, which was formed back in December 2006. It was also the 68th launch of an Atlas V rocket and the third in its 431 configuration. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. For more, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Just search for Space Time with Stuart Gary.